Welcome to The Launch, the podcast sponsored by Tandem Launch, where we talk about tech, startups, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. We give you the inside scoop on building a startup, capital fundraising, the entrepreneurial journey, with both funny and impactful stories. This podcast is for budding entrepreneurs, ecosystem players, industry folks, venture capitalists looking for deals, students considering a career in the startup world, or anyone with a curiosity in Deepak. If you have a research background in tech and always wanted to build your own startup, then check out our website, www.tenemlaunch.com, or hit us up on LinkedIn. Let's build the future together. And now, on with show. Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of the Launch Podcast sponsored by Tandem Launch. I'm Bobby Bedochka, your host, and joining me today is CEO of Contextful, Guillaume Bouchard. Welcome. Thank you so much, Guillaume. Likewise, very happy to be there today. So let's do the normal get started with. Tell us a bit about yourself and maybe uh, share your entrepreneurial journey. Cool. Well, uh, I'm going to skip the part why I started selling lemonade when I was uh, five or six years old. But uh, very quickly out of college, uh, I jumped into an entrepreneurship type of role called College Pro Painters, which is where you learn pretty much everything about running a business, uh, doing uh, cold calling, uh, knocking on doors at minus 20 degrees, understanding how to hire people, uh, do your first sales, the first marketing pieces, manage uh, a budget. So I jumped into that when I was 19. I really fell in love with uh, what it was. It was a very tough journey. I think learning your first gig as an entrepreneur is uh, probably the, the toughest because you have really no clue what you're doing. Uh, and I did that very for like four or five years while I was doing my undergraduate degree. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, became the rookie of the year when it started. Then I became the, the youngest uh, manager of franchisees in North America uh, the year later. Uh, And it was a very difficult uh, experience, but I really, really enjoyed it. Built a team of like 15 folks that were doing paint jobs uh, in the summer. Uh, And then when I finished school uh, in HEC Montreal, I had to write a business plan to to launch a business. Um, And I had a very uh, bad idea, which was to launch a web design firm in 2004 just after the bubble uh, in Montreal, where there was already uh, over 100 agencies doing the exact same thing that we were doing. Uh, And for the first year, it was extremely difficult uh, just to meet uh, payroll for ourselves, for the the founders. Uh, But uh, after a year, we stumbled a little bit by accident on uh, marketing, web marketing. And this is where uh, everything started for the business. Uh, and then the business skyrocketed. We started to do what we called SEO and quickly re- became the, the biggest guys uh, in the country uh, selling uh, SEO. Uh, and after eight years, from 2004 to 2013, we sold our agency to Densu, uh, which is one of the large uh, big six uh, media media firm. Uh, and I stayed five years for a uh, earnout. It is a very lengthy period to... Uh, to, to do an earnout, especially the business was public. So we were uh, literally, I call this as running 20 quarters with a public company. It was a very uh, like learning, big learning experience for us to move from being on our own to reporting to uh, Toronto, New York, London, and then and then Tokyo. So I learned a lot of things there. And when I left, we were uh, roughly 100 people, uh, 60 in uh, Montreal and 40 in Toronto. We were managing the, the largest performance agency uh, in the in the country. Uh, and yeah, and this is when I stumbled upon again by accident on uh, the Tandem Launch uh, Incubator. Met with uh, Emily early 2018. I was very tired at the time. So I met the people that are part of Contextful now, the founders, but told them that it would take me at least six months to commit to a, a full-time job. So I was meeting with them on a on a weekly basis and was spending a day a week uh, in the incubator. Uh, and then, uh, well, the last three years I've been at uh, Contextful full time. Uh, we went through uh, uh, several rounds of financing. We're currently also uh, doing another one, which I think we'll talk a little bit later in the uh, in the podcast. But yeah, so I, from painting to running uh, 
marketing agency uh, to running an ad tech uh, company. Uh, and I think what I was really excited about in this gig is that I went from running a national service business to launching an international product uh, uh, in the same industry. So uh, super excited about that. Like the 15 years of experience that I, I'm, I'm bringing, let's say, in the business are extremely helpful, uh, especially at this stage. So yeah, super excited uh, to have found that minimum viable technology that existed at uh, Tandem Launch and uh, help the team shape it up to, uh, to become what it is today. Wow, amazing. Um, yeah. I I'm from Saskatchewan, and when I was, uh, yeah, in my early 20s, you used to see the College Pro signs on people's lawns just everywhere. God, what a yeah. grind. So, you know, bravo to you for <laughs> uh, starting out there. That's definitely a hard, that's, those are some hard it, lessons. <laughs> it was a harder version than the, what you see in the movie American Pie, to be honest. It was not just fun, but uh, <laughs> I had a lot of fun. That probably, the out of the three experience, the one where I had the most uh, fun but I was still in school so that that played a big role into that as well lovely yes so I mean I know that you're working on something that's really really cool uh so why don't you tell uh tell our audience a little bit what uh what is contextful and uh, what you're working on cool well the, the whole idea of contextful outside of what it already was when I joined the incubator and how it became what it is is that when I used to run my agency, we were buying uh, at the end of roughly $200 million of media a year for blue chip companies like uh, Home Depot, Transat, uh, Microsoft, uh, GM, you name it. And mm. it was a very frustrating experience to buy a programmatic inventory because a lot of what you would buy, you would never know what you would buy. There was very high margins taken in the ecosystem, a little bit like coffee has so many broker layers that you end up uh, not paying really for the product, but paying a lot for uh, everything, everyone in the process. Mm -hmm. So I was really frustrated because the, the, the performance of that compared to search or social type of channels was always hard to justify, but still we knew we needed to push video, display ads, native ads, in-app advertising. So when I found the, 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 the tech that the guys were working on, I got super excited because I was like, wow, that's a way that we could probably improve a lot that ecosystem. And what happened in what Contextful is, is what we do is, and we took a very ethical stance to that. What we do is we leverage uh, sensors, motion sensors that are found on mobile devices. Uh, and we're able to interpret the sensors to understand how attentive a user is to uh, its device in real time. Uh, and we build two products, a pre-bid and a post-bid type of product. Uh, and, and yeah, in, in a nutshell, what we're helping is we're helping publishers make more money with their inventory. We're helping advertisers buy better inventory. Uh, and we're, we're doing it in a way that is very different than how the GAFA does it. We took a stance of not generating any PII, so no private information. We're not using the camera, the GPS, the sensor, the, the microphone. We're literally, we're mainly using the gyroscope and the accelerometer. And in the future, a couple more non-private sensor like uh, ambient light to understand the kind of lighting you see in a room or uh, speakers to understand the loudness there is in a room without listening to, uh, to the voices. So yeah, the whole idea is how can we achieve some marketing? Uh, how can we add a layer of quality on anything that we, we buy from publishers without having to invade privacy that does a whole gist of what uh, the technology is and we called it since a year and a half it's been called receptivity mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of months ago we relaunched the brand where well, we fully officially launched a brand which you can find on contextful.com slash receptivity and we're really happy uh, about the, the the results we're we're seeing so far with uh, with customers Okay, so it's kind of like like in the phone. There's people don't realize that there's so like some gyroscopy type of thing that lets people know sort of where what angle? Where is your phone at? It's here, 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 right? Yeah. yeah. An example of what it's going to do is let's say you're just opening uh, national polls or you're opening any kind of website. Uh, what it's going to say is, is a user holding the device? Is the user looking at the device without using the camera? Is the user in an environment that is prone to be receptive? Like, am I on the fly, like running to try to catch a bus or I'm sitting like right now comfortably in my chair and am I looking at the device or no, I'm not looking at the device. This is the kind of signal that uh, 
were able to, to tell the publisher just before he's going to sell an ad. So it gives him the possibility to charge more because, quote unquote, we sell prime time type of audiences. Uh, and it's a first party data set that uh, can be leveraged, as I said, both from the publisher and the advertiser standpoint. And the whole idea was, can we achieve that without hurting or, let's say, risking any any private data? So that's really the sandbox that we're in. Uh, we, will, we will know a user is engaged with his device. We'll know that he's holding the device. But we won't know who, who it is, and, and that's the, the the beauty of it because cookies are going away, mm -hmm. uh, and people are very much aware and sensitive about private data now. So uh, being sure that we don't run on cookies and that it is a private uh, private by privacy by design type of framework uh, helps a lot into our uh, commercialization. And so, just for those who don't know, um, what is inventory and what is GAFA? Yeah, the GAFA is Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, which pretty much offer and, and play a huge role in advertising. And when I talk about inventory, I'm talking as a publisher, every time people hit your website, you're going to be selling, let's say, display banners, video uh, that are going to run, and you're charging advertisers for that. So mm -hmm. helping publishers to monetize their inventory further means that we're helping them sell uh, they're, they're, advertise, they're advertising to advertiser at, uh, at a higher price. Okay, amazing. Um, and so I, I was reading this article recently um, about like Nielsen, the Nielsen's findings. Like I remember back when, you know, they were the company that somehow knew what shows we were watching on TV. Um, but so that was like a traditional ways of measuring attention and engagement. So, but I guess Nielsen's going away or, you know, that's, it, they're not useful anymore? It's, yeah, they're not necessarily going away, but they got, uh, I would say, slapped on their hands by the MRC because they, it was proven that their model is not, let's say, modern enough to measure, uh, let's say, new devices and provide a real attention measurement. So what, pretty much what the industry is saying is they lost their accreditation from the MRC. And pretty much what the Media Rating Council is saying is, we need a multiverse of uh, new measurement alternative to make sure that we are truly measuring attention. A very good example of that, which is not necessarily related to Nielsen, but it gives a good idea, is 15 years ago, uh, a couple of companies, namely Moat, IES, and Double Verify, and like seven, eight others came to, to life and said, hey, we're gonna invent a metric that allows you to see if users, when they get push an ad, well, if they view the ad on the screen, that was invented during <clears throat> the time where mobile was not really uh, the thing. So what would happen is you would, uh, you would be able to know once an ad is fired, if it's going on the screen and if people are at least having a chance to view it, which we would call an ad that would be deemed viewable versus a non-viewable ad. There are two big limitations with viewability. The first one is that a you need to serve the ad before you know if an ad is viewable. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it's not, well, tough luck, you still paid for the inventory. The second thing is when you try to adapt viewability to mobile, which is what most of these companies have done, uh, it is not a direct correlation with performance. Because as an example, if your ad format or ad unit is small, it's going to record a very high receptivity, but it might not have the impact you're expecting. There's also a lot of fraud where a bot can go on and scroll on a screen. It's going to look like the ad is viewable, but it will never be seen by, by humans. So a lot of the studies uh, mention that, and people argue, but between 50 to 80% of all ads ever being fired are never seen. Uh, and, and that's a big problem because the main metric that everyone is using to report and buy and, and, and tell advertisers that they got the, the best bang for their money is that viewability signal. So that's why we came with receptivity saying, well, can we do the measurement before the ad is sold? And can we have a guarantee when you're on your mobile that you're attentive to your device, that you're looking at your device and that you're a real human being? So that's the whole idea of the tech is being able to, uh, to tell you that before it's too late so that you can play with the old marketing adage of 50% of my marketing doesn't work but uh, I don't know which half of the two. Uh, mm -hmm. We're really trying to combat that on top of uh, detecting fraud. We're just making sure that you're paying for attentive eyeballs.
Yeah, that's great. Because I, like, if you think about COVID, when all of a sudden all the conferences and events and everything, you know, they tried to map that on to like Zooms and stuff. And it's just, I mean, it just falls short, right? So you can't always take traditional models and just map them onto new technologies and expect them to work the same. Yeah. And I mean, it's a reality the same way all of these guys are media players. They used to sell newspapers or they still do in some cases. They run TV. So TV got adapted to desktop. Desktop's getting adapted to mobile. For us, we didn't have the legacy of living with old measurements, uh, clients that still needed a lot of things. So we, we spinned it around, spin it on its head and we said, okay, what is the most, the best way we can identify if a user is attentive without, again, touching uh, any, uh, having, having him to ask for, uh, for his authorization? Uh, so we said, well, if we know he's, lo he's looking at the device and using the device, that's probably the best signal. So what we're working on right now as an example is we are going to build a model where we can derive some of these learnings, even if we don't have sensors on desktop. But if we're identifying pockets, well, let's say periods of the day, specific publishers, different, let's say, formats of creatives that we look that are more receptive on average than others, we'll be able to build a signal and then offer it to, uh, to, to the desktop environments so that's a little bit what we're doing. We're starting with what we feel is the most relevant signal for attention. And we're going to try to contaminate, let's say, the rest of the ecosystem with that uh, that data point. Wow. So, yeah, this sounds really disruptive. I guess you're going to be like the Netflix of marketing tech, let's we're say. Working yeah. We're working on that. Throw everybody aside. Um, okay. So then what about, uh, if, you know, just... We have quite a few entrepreneurs um, or aspirational entrepreneurs, um, startups listening to the podcast. What advice would you give them of lessons that you've learned over time? Um, one of the, 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 the lesson is a lot of, well, entrepreneurship is, uh, is a hard thing. Um, it is, and I'll explain that with, let's say, a, a pack of wolves as, a, as an example, but a uh, you know, the, the, the leader of the wolf pack is going to be the one that's behind, that's the last barrier that's looking that everything's going smoothly. Uh, I think there was, there was too much marketing done on the entrepreneurial type of function. Uh, yes, it's prominent. Yes, you, you can win big. But I've done a study and a lot of studies went out recently that showcase that entrepreneurs are extremely stressed, that there's, there's a lot of businesses that fail like 75% of any startup will fail the first year. Another half will fail the second year. So you're down to one out of eight after two years. So I think there's a big misconception into what the entrepreneurial role is. Um, it is, to me, a, a burden. It is a burden that, uh, that you choose. Uh, but it is a burden nevertheless. It, to me, like uh, I've never had as much stress as when you get, let's go into a financing round or when you're pitching to a large client that if you don't win it, you might lose some employees. So I just wanna make sure that people that are really trying to become entrepreneurs understand the commitment and they understand the commitment, not, not necessarily, well, just more from a, it is a mindset to me. Uh, and also it's not by working a hundred hours that you'll achieve that. You have to build some work-life balance. I don't believe that working more than 50-ish hours a week will get you anywhere in the long run, especially if you're trying to build a healthy business. If you tell everyone that you're pushing for work-life balance, but you're working 80 hours, it, it sends a very uh, con contradictory type of, uh, uh, of message. Um, so yeah, I think the, the, the message I want to pass upon is that you need to take that that uh, that role very seriously i mean there is gonna for every time you're gonna get a tap in the back you're gonna have to give 10 taps to to people and, and you're gonna probably get a couple slaps in the face as well so for sure i think uh if you're looking for that to get external recognition uh, it's really really not uh, the, the right place to be that being said it is an amazing uh, journey uh, from let's say my first gig to to this one I don't think I would do uh, anything else. But if you ask me after this business, if I'm really looking towards becoming a CEO again and starting again, honestly, I have a serious conversation to have with myself because now it's been three times that I'm running uh, a company. And the, the, the level of flexibility you get, let's say, in your day-to-day -day schedule 
is okay, but overall the responsibilities that you occupy on a, on a, on a daily basis are, are extremely uh, difficult to bear. And, and I mean, COVID for me was extremely difficult in the sense that I'm a very sociable person. Uh, I'm more of a revenue type of CEO. So I was meeting people, going to conferences, building relationships, and, and having to do that on Zoom was, uh, was very, very different. Mm -hmm. uh, we're losing uh, most of the nonverbal signals. We're, we're, we're missing that instantaneity that you get in uh, being next to people. So yeah, so uh, I'm not sure that the next gig, uh, uh, I would, let's say, jump as the, the, the CEO role. Although I'm highly motivated now, uh, we know where we're going and we're super excited. It's still a, uh, a it's, it is a burden. And so I want to give the advice to people to take the role seriously, to not to do it because you're looking for, uh, for fame. It is something where you end up being very often uh, alone at the top doesn't mean that you don't have an amazing team and that don't have an amazing team. I love my team. I, I would not change them, but uh, sometimes you always end up taking decisions and the decisions are, it's, it's either a terrible decision or a catastrophic decision. And you're, you're playing with, with these kind of, uh, of decisions. And I'm sure that most businesses that work in deep tech, like what Tandem Launch does are going through these, uh, these kind of, uh, of, of patterns because Having a deep tech business for a while, just nothing happens. And then three, four, five years later, maybe it, it skyrockets. Yeah. Uh, and an example of that is a friend of mine that we did uh, uh, university together. I launched my uh, marketing agency out of school. He decided to build carbon uh, uh, wheelchairs. So for, for me, for five years, I grew the business. And five years in, we were making three, four, five million revenue. After five years, he got his wheelchair, carbon wheelchair certified, and he started selling his first wheelchair on year five. And, and to me, that's an interesting contrast, but it is a little bit what deep tech companies are. And he mm -hmm. did a hundred plus business plan just to stay alive because he was generating zero revenue. And you can apply that logic to most deep tech companies. Contextful, it took us, uh, yes, we got a couple of co-development type of revenue, but it took us up until uh, this quarter to really start to take off our, uh, our revenue. We were making, uh, let's say 10, 15 KMR, but we were just trying to do product market fit, but the product had been out for, for a bit, but not, not necessarily a real full enterprise type of product. It was more of an alpha. So uh, that, that, that period of time of uncertainty, well, you have to raise and, and sell and pitch a business. It's a very, very interesting times to, uh, to say the least. Well, Guillaume, you clearly seem to be a sucker for punishment, <laughs> but it is, yeah, it is a, it's a really tough road. And I, when I speak to um, aspirational entrepreneurs and we ask them sort of, why do you want to do this? They often say, you know, I want to be in control of my schedule and I, I want to be able to make decisions and stuff like that. And, you know, there's certain elements of that, but overall it's like, this is just a gross misunderstanding of how much, burden and work and you know instead of having one boss you have now like investors and clients and just like you have a million bosses it's just a different um dynamic altogether which is why doing the podcast is really important so that people get you know a more realistic um concept of of what life is like um so let's just quickly talk about product to market fit and or build it and they will come politics um so i'm wondering if you can uh, chat with us a bit about um, how how that worked um, with you. Yeah, so if I'm going to tell an interesting story, probably no, not a lot of people have heard about it. So when I joined the Tandem Launch Incubator, the guys had built what I would call the human context engine. We didn't know really what we were going to do with it. We were thinking of trying in the insurance uh, part uh, of the business, maybe at tech. Then we tried both and we ended up doing more at tech. Uh, but at first, really, the idea is you you talk to VCs, you pitch whatever you have built, and you listen, and then you go see customers, and you do the same thing. Uh, the, the, I would say from where we were to where we went, and if and then trying to divide that in a couple of phases. The first phase is what we had built is that engine, and we had a couple of labels that we were able to identify. So let's say an, an example of a label is uh, is your posture, for example. So are you 
in a, in a place where you're comfortably seated, for example, or let's say movement, so in Hertz, uh, is the phone moving at a speed that the eye is able to read uh, on the screen? So what we were doing is we were showing up to, uh, to companies, to agencies, or to publishers and say, hey, look at that, we have all of these labels. And people were like, well, that's pretty cool tech. But, but. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do with that? And investors were a little bit the same way. So that took us really a long time to say, okay, what do we do with that tech? So we went from trying to get a minimum viable tech <clears throat> to get a minimum viable product. And, and let's say the, the moment uh, that it happened was in the summer of uh, 2019, where we decided to name what we were doing, combine all of these labels together into a signature of attention. And, and then I think it's Benoit, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know, but I think that's what it is. But Benoit decided to, uh, to, to name that receptivity. I really liked the name because it was saying, well, receptivity means the, the passive uh, state of being uh, ready to receive and be attentive. So we felt, okay, that's exactly uh, what we're trying to say. At the same time, a year ago, we had rebranded the business from Proximity HCI to Contextful because we know contextful, con contextual advertising was going to get big. So we said, okay, name of the business is Context, Contextful, perfect. Uh, and then Receptivity came in, which is a, a good derivative for uh, the attention economy and everybody that's talking about attention. Uh, but yeah, at that very moment, people started to understand what we were trying to do. But that was phase one, just naming it and packaging it so that it would be properly understood. The next step was you need to put it into people's hands, trying to see what they do with it. And most people didn't know what to do with it. So we had to try to, to tell them what to do, listen what they were saying. And that another full year, year and a half came by and took some feedback, created a first version of, a, of our measurement product, created our first version of our monetization product for publishers then got feedback again. Okay, well, I'm not going to install it because of this or it's very limited because of that. Uh, and then we got a bit uh, unlucky because uh, Apple started to say that you required a permission to fetch sensors uh, on, well, not even non-private sensors on uh, their devices. So we lost half of the inventory we were able to target. So now go back to the drawing board and say, okay, how do we get that back by building... Uh, a model that can leverage what we learn in the Android side and uh, apply it to, to iOS. Uh, and it's finally at the late late summer, like early fall, that was like, okay, now we have a product for publisher that people like. We have a dozen business cases showing that A-B tests are generating results. And we have a measurement solution that we migrated, well, we're actually in the midst of it, migrated to an enterprise type of dashboarding software. Uh, and, and it's the first time that and we hired a first salesperson in the summer. We hired a customer success manager in the spring. And it's the first time that we're going to the market with what I would call products that, that can stand on their own and that can compete with, with, uh, with the other folks. But, and all of this is being accomplished with a team of 15. And when we look at the comparison competitor like IS and Mode, they just did IPOs for like 4 billion each. There's six, 700 people. So... It's a tough market to be in. And in that tech, there's 9,000 companies competing for marketing dollars. So uh, in that tech, my two cents, if you ever wonder uh, and try to, to play in that tech, you really need to build something that is not an increment to the industry, but you need to build something that is a revolution because that's the only way that you're going to have a chance to, to stand up. And now we're pretty happy. The ecosystem in Canada is starting to recognize the metric. Uh, there are several publishers and and uh, top six of the big six media agencies that are using it and also large independent agencies. Some of them of which have contributed into the, the, the funding of the company, both publisher and uh, independent agencies. So we're super excited about uh, what lies ahead, but it's been a, a, a long desert uh, desert walk. <laughs> and uh, at, and you, all, you would always see the oasis, but you never knew when you were gonna get it if it was just a mirage and you would still have to walk. <laughs> And I think it's the first time that we're able to take a, a, a glass of water and say, oh, now we, that gives us, let's say, the, the momentum to, uh, to keep pushing. Wow. So thank you so much for sharing that story, because it is, is very typical um, of that sort of journey. And it usually surprises people um, 
so yeah, entrepreneurs take note that this is sort of what's ahead. Yeah. I was for- surprised myself. Like uh, I ran a service agency the first year we were making half a million dollar revenue, five years in five million. So it was always a, some sort of a, you grind and you get and you build. And this is really like this, where a, a product company is, is like just doing nothing. And at some point you, you find market fit. And, it, and as a person that had never run a product uh, company, that was probably the, the hardest learning because I'm a very sales oriented person and seeing every quarter that revenues are roughly flat, that you're still away from having people, let's say, liking your product and being sticky enough. Honestly, the, I, I was not prepared for that, but uh, I feel that we're now, let's say, at, at the end of what I would say that the, the product market fit uh, conundrum. So really happy that uh, we're starting to see the, the fruit of all these efforts. Amazing. So exciting times for Contextful. Uh, so yeah, so why don't you let our audience know um, what are your needs? Are you hiring? Are you fundraising? And how can people get in touch with you? Cool. Well, we're always looking for, uh, for, for talent, uh, both on the revenue front and uh, data, tech, R&D, product front. Uh, the two open position now uh, are uh, around uh, a product uh, manager, product owner, somebody that would have uh, experience in ad tech that's looking to be part of uh, the next category leader in uh, verification uh, measurement. So that's one position that that is open now. Uh, We just hired also a a dev manager that's gonna start uh, in January and we'll be looking to hire a few more people, as I said, both in the revenue and uh, the the tech team. Although for now, the main focus of the business is raising a a large round. Uh, We're looking to raise a uh, well, a couple million dollars, uh, probably around four or five million, uh, and combine it with uh, government programs, uh, loans, and things like that to use to get roughly double of that amount to uh, to leverage in the next uh, the next two years. Because we ho- we held as long as we could uh, with what we had to get the products ready, but now we're starting into what I would say the, the not so the more fun phase, but the more traction driven type of phase where you have real customers. You have real feedback. You get uh, more and more revenue. You there's the sales cycle are, are shorter. So uh, yeah, I think what we're looking now is a couple of things. But we're looking for for VCs that are looking to be part of uh, of a next next gen category of uh, of ad tech that focuses on the attention economy. Uh, we're looking for for strategic investors as well that are already part of that and wants to. Uh, to help to change the world in a, in a better way, because again, uh, one of our big play is that we're providing uh, very ethical marketing, which is different from uh, most of the incumbents, especially on, uh, as I said, on the, the GAFA side and nothing against them. But uh, if you can achieve great marketing without having to collect uh, billions of data points on, on your private life, like why not? Uh, but yeah, we are currently in raise mode. I started meeting with VCs in the last, uh, two weeks and we hope to to close around in Q1 that will carry us for for the next two years and let us break out and, and generate meaningful uh, revenues. And so how do people get in touch with you? Uh, they can write me an email at uh, guillaume at contextful.com. I'm sure you're going to find a way in the the, the, the vidcast uh, to, uh, to, add, to add that. But uh, they can also get on the Contextful website. Just write us an email. We'll, we'll get in touch. Uh, very straightforward. Uh, I'm the one that's uh, fielding all of the the, the VC uh, or investor uh, touch points. So, yeah. Okay, fabulous. Well, thank you so much, uh, Guillaume, again for joining us and jamming about this new wave of ad tech and with ethics. I'm I can guarantee you people appreciate that. Um, and thank you uh, for our loyal listeners. Your time is always appreciated. You can follow us on social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget, if you have a technical background and you want to create a startup with Tandem Launch, then hit me up on LinkedIn and I can tell you about all those incredible opportunities. So ciao for now. Thank you for listening. We hope you had fun and gained valuable insights. Why don't you subscribe to the Launch Podcast today? You can share the podcast, tell a friend, and follow us on social media. If you have a research background in tech and always wanted to build your own startup, then check out our website, 
www.tandemlaunch.com and get in touch today.